Hey folks, before we get started, I just wanted to tell you, you can unlock unlimited access to political news, commentary, opinion, and a whole lot more at inforum.news forward slash port for only 99 cents a month for your first three months. Hurry, get this limited time offer at inforum.news forward slash port now. This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes and powering our vehicles to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, Oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Welcome to Plant Talk. Of course, I am your host, Rob Port, and uh, happy happy Monday to you. So, in, in the state of North Dakota, we are having a debate over a new pipeline, and <laughs> pipeline debates are not new to the state of North Dakota, uh, but this one is a little different uh, because of what the pipeline is potentially going to carry. It's the Carbon Express pipeline to be built, built by Summit Carbon Solutions, and the plant seems to be evolving a little bit, but essentially what it is is it, it would collect carbon from ethanol plants across the upper Midwest, bring them to North Dakota, and then put that carbon down underground. Um, Governor Doug Burgum has been very excited about this. His administration has been talking about it. It's gotten a lot of news coverage. An oil industry titan in North Dakota, at least, Harold Hamm, uh, has announced that he's going to invest a couple of hundred million dollars into the project. Um, it's a big deal. And honestly, I've been excited about it. I think, A, this is something that we can do to try to bring some of our existing industries into line with modern understandings about the climate. And also, economically speaking, potentially it's a new industry for our state that could employ people and create new opportunities. Um, people make a lot of... Uh, People talk a lot about how our, our geology here in North Dakota, a lot of, of what allows um, North Dakota to be so rich in oil also makes this a good place for us to, to put a lot of a lot of carbon. But uh, not everybody likes this idea. So uh, there's a debate going on about whether or not this is truly a good thing. And recently in a column, I noted that the Sierra Club is, is opposed to the pipeline. And I actually got an email from... Uh, Dr. Dexter Perkins, he's a uh, geologist working for the University of North Dakota, and he said, hey, what's this stuff you said about the Sierra Club opposing the Carbon Express pipeline? Uh, because our local chapter of discussed it and decided not to oppose it. And I noted that, that Sierra chapters in Iowa and other parts of the country were opposing it, but I got interested in that. So I decided to have Mr. Perkins on to, to discuss the project uh, from that perspective. Dexter, welcome to the, the, the program. Thanks for the time. Oh, I'm glad to be here. So, so tell us about the, 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 this pipeline. What, what are your feelings about it? Well, I should, I should be uh, in the interest of full disclosure tell you that I suspect that if we voted whether to support it or not, we would vote that we are in opposition. Um, because most people in um, the Sierra Club in North Dakota don't think this is this project is going to go anywhere, and see it as a distraction from some of the more significant things we might be considering doing to address the problem of climate change. Um, the problem with CO2 capture and storing it underground is, in a nutshell, no one's ever done it successfully on any large scale. Um, it's been done sometimes to promote enhanced oil and gas recovery, which is, I think, one of the major motives for building a pipeline to North Dakota right now, Harold Hamm. Um, I'm in the Harold Hamm School of Geology, so I know Harold Hamm. Uh, but he wants CO2 to help him produce more oil in western North Dakota. I got it. But in terms of storing a lot of carbon dioxide and addressing the climate change problem, there's no reason to think it's going to do anything. Uh, it's been tried before. Uh, maybe the Petronova plant in Texas was the largest example, and they had incredible cost overruns when they constructed, and they only operated a few years, and then they shut down because, for technical reasons, they weren't hitting their targets, and it was too expensive to operate. And so I, I wish 
this was the solution to our problems. I mean, if we could store CO2 underground in North Dakota, as you said, there's a lot of good reasons for doing it. Uh, but I'm skeptical um, that it's ever going to come to fruition. And um, in the meantime, I think we should probably be focusing on alternative sources of energy and conservation and all the other stuff that we already know how to do. What, what frustrates me a little bit when I hear, I hear that attitude, and I'm, I'm not saying, my argument is not that I, I know carbon capture is going to be a success. Um, my argument is, gosh, a lot, of, a lot of people are investing a lot of money in it. And, and again, that's not always an indicator of success either. People invest a lot of money in stupid things uh, with regularity. But I, I guess is why not try? I mean, just because it hasn't been done successfully before doesn't mean it can't be done successfully going forward. We get better at things all the time. We have advancements in technology. And, I mean, it, it's possible it, it could work. And, and, and what worries me is, is if I, I feel sometimes like, like the climate change debate breaks down to this either or. Either you're for fossil fuels or you're for just completely something else. And I, I, I think the path forward has got to include both. Because, you know, okay, maybe carbon capture doesn't work. On the other hand, you're saying, well, we should be looking for alternatives. Well, what alternative is there to oil which touches every single part of our life? You look at how the American public is reacting to gas price increases right now. If you think that there's the political will out there to ex enact the sort of changes that would be required of the way we live our lives to replace oil with something else— you know, I, I, got, I got a bridge to sell you, man. I just don't think it's going to happen. Well, you're trying to, I think you're pushing me into a corner that I don't really want to go into. Okay. First of all, I think our future is, is a petroleum future. Okay. There's going to be oil being used to power our industry and our cars for a long time. So the, given that reality, the question is, what are we going to do to address climate change? And one thing is to use less oil. And you can do that by switching to other fuels as fast and conveniently as you can. But recognize, as you say, the world's not going to stop just because somebody from some environmental group says you can't use oil tomorrow. It's just not going to happen. That's living in la-la land. Or you can sell me a bridge if you want to. <laughs> but it, we are going to go forward. Um, but I can tell you, my wife and I built a house three years ago here in Grand Forks, it uses 5% the energy of any other house in town. Um, it didn't take a lot of effort or thinking or planning to come up with a design and build an incredibly energy efficient house. This week, because it's not been very cold, it's only been down in the single digits, we haven't even turned on the heater. We get all our heating through our south facing windows because the house was designed with that in mind. I mean, there are a lot of things like that you can do which aren't a question of switching to an alternative fuel source. They're a question of just using less energy. And when you combine that with alternative fuels, and I've, I've heard you talk about how wind and solar don't always work all the time, but they work some of the time. And we've got a battery in our house, and we charge up from our solar panels every morning, and then we have enough electricity to see us overnight the next night. Um, so there are a lot of things you can do. And as I said, I think this pipeline thing is a distraction. But one of the reasons our group didn't come out against it was we're hoping we're wrong. As you say, give it, if it works, everybody's happy. And we'll all be grinning, and it will be good for North Dakota economy, and it will be good for everybody. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it. It's like Project Tundra, right, north of Bismarck. They're going to store... CO2 underground to keep a coal plant operating cleanly, they say. Um, I'll give you three to one odds on a dollar that that plant, that coal capture project never even starts. Uh, because the technical problems that no one else has been able to overcome are still there. But keep our fingers crossed because it would be a wonderful thing if people could work it out. Well, that's I, I, and I guess I guess that's the thing. It it's you know it, it seems like we have a lot of advancements. Uh, you know, humanity doing things that we didn't think could happen. I mean, we I, I always like to cite the example of um, Malthusian economics, which it, at one point was predicting that uh, humanity was going to grow, our population was going to grow to the point where we couldn't support ourselves with agriculture. And what that didn't take into account was 
well, we're going to get better at agriculture. We're going to get better at yield rates. We're going to get better where we could grow more crops that are more resistant to, you know, weeds and, and the other problems that, that our food sources were going to become more reliable. I mean, it was it was a miracle. So I, I don't know. Like, I want to bet on human ingenuity. I, I, I think sometimes for me as somebody who's very much not a part of the environmental movement, at least. I mean, I, I share, like, I don't want to dump oil in, in rivers and lakes, and I don't want to emit things we don't need to be emitting into the air. Um, you know, but but beyond, like, I, I kind of look at it, it seems so dark. Like, it seems so, at times, cynical. Like, like we don't have any choice but to take these dramatic steps and change how everybody li lives their lives. I mean, I look at carbon capture, and I see that is human ingenuity at work to try to find a solution to a real problem, and I want to support that. I don't want to be opposed to that. Which, which I think is the same argument you're making. I mean, I feel like that's that's the area that that you and I are are and and your your local Sierra Club that they're overlapping. Well, I think I think we all love it if it would work. Um, but with that said, I don't think we I don't think we want to take our eye off the ball about all the other things that we might possibly be doing. I mean, people for their own convenience ignore the problem of climate change. Here in Grand Forks, we're proposing to build a wet corn milling plant that's going to be the number one producer of greenhouse gases in the region. And the city council has already voted to invest $100 million into bringing the new largest polluter in our region to Grand Forks. I think that is immoral. Um, but it's not convenient, so the people in charge of city government are just ignoring that. And at some point, you've got to focus on taking steps that you know are practical. Not everybody's going to want to give up their F-150, Rob. I got it, you know? Yeah. But if half the people give up their F-150 or a third, we've made progress, and that saves us money, that's that's a win-win-win-win across the board. And that's the sort of stuff we ought to be focusing on. Yeah, it's just stuff that has to make – I mean, to me, it always has to make economic sense. Like, if you give somebody an alternative where it makes sense, like, like if the alternative costs less – I mean – I think the reason why a lot of people haven't been driving electric cars to this point, understanding that, that this is a situation that's getting better. And I'm very enthusiastic about electric cars. I think they're cool. I hope to own one one day. But for a lot of Americans, they're just not very practical. And they haven't been. And, and in the past, they've been very expensive. And, you know, the, I think there are range issues that people are concerned about. Like, you know, for a while I was looking, like, if I bought a Tesla, I couldn't get from Minot to Fargo especially not in cold weather, without having to stop for an hour to charge it. Um, you know, that's, that's and, and where, I mean, where do I stop? I mean, the charging stations are few and far between. It's just not real practical. But I, I, I worry, like, I, I think I think we could do stuff. It's just if, if we're trying to impose it on people, I think that's, I think that's the problem. But, but you know, getting back to this, um, again, I, I, I don't, I want to be enthusiastic about it. I, I want to support it. And, and you're, I, you know, I, I guess you're saying your point about Fu Feng, I think, was really interesting because an argument that I've been making lately is that we're, we're kind of pushing our guilt out of, out of sight, out of mind. Like, we don't want to build it here. We don't want to build a corn milling plant here in the United States. OK, well, corn still needs to be milled somewhere. So where are we going to build it? We're going to build it out in the middle of the out in the middle of nowhere where there, there's fewer people to complain about it. Are we going to build it in another country that maybe isn't going to have our level of oversight and regulation around it? Which I think it's a lot of what what like Europe has done with coal and gas and oil. They stopped producing it in, in Europe or at least reduced production of it in Europe, but just moved it to places like Russia, which I don't know. That just kind of seems like we're exporting our guilt. Oh, that's not a good solution to the problem. But um, if you're going to build a corn milling plant today, given what we know about climate change, you don't power it by burning natural gas. You power it in some other way. Um, and it is possible to build plants that run and process corn that are much more friendly to the environment than the one that's being proposed. The one that's being proposed for Grand Forks is just same old, the way it's always been done. And that's the problem. You, you got to be innovative, trust human ingenuity to come up with a new way to get you to the same goals that you want to get to. But then, isn't that the argument in favor of carbon capture? I mean, isn't that human ingenuity? I mean, and, and I guess I'm, I'm asking you. You're, you're not saying you're opposed to it. I, I guess, which is what I'm I'm kind of in, in, implying here, which you're not. But but some of your, I mean, we have other Sierra Club chapters that are. 
And to me, I think that's a mistake. Why would you oppose this? Why would the Sierra Club oppose carbon capture? I don't understand it. Um, again, you're, you you got to be careful about talking about the club because, as you know, we're a whole bunch of different entities. That's but, fair, yeah. Uh, I understand it. As a hardcore, used-to-be unyielding uh, environmental activist, I was pretty sure I knew what the solutions were to all the problems and what we should be doing. And today, as I've you know grown up a little bit and get a little more mature, I realize that I'm not 100% certain I know what the solutions are. But zealots, people working on any issue, whether it's an environmental cause or a Donald Trump supporter, are they see things their way, and they're going to be very outspoken and aggressive and, and push what they think is the right thing to do. And I applaud people for that sort of stuff. Um, but at some point, you got to get together and start talking and trying to figure out really uh, what the path forward is and what it is you can agree on instead of arguing about what it is you disagree on. And, and I, I think the solutions have to work. I mean, you, you, you brought up you know me, me talking about wind turbines and solar panels. They don't work. I'm kind of like you. I'm, I'm kind of the same mind as you are about those things as you are about carbon capture and that I'm all for them if they work. But, you know, I heard Warren Buffett said not that long ago that the only good reason to build a wind turbine is to capture the, the, the subsidies from the government. And we can get into a whole debate about government subsidies and everything else. I don't really want to go down that road. But I, I worry that, you know, we're, we're producing wind to, to, you know, the incentive to produce wind is, is political, not necessarily driven by realities in the marketplace and, and something that, that doesn't that doesn't conform to the realities of the marketplace will inevitably fail. I, I think, I think that's just truth. So I would like those things to work. I think it'd be beautiful if they did. I just don't, I don't think that they do. And the idea that we could just switch to them is a, is a fantasy. Well, I, I think you're wrong. Um, and I think the economics of wind and solar have been well demonstrated in, uh, Western states in the United States where power companies are using wind and solar, and it's not just because of, of subsidies. But, you know, subsidies are, we do that, we use that to influence human behavior. I mean, the reason carbon capture is possible in North Dakota tax is because credits. of the federal tax subsidies. Tax credits, yep, absolutely. So it, it, we always use subsidies to try and get, to, what, did, what did Garrett Hardin call it, mutually agreed upon coercion? Yeah. You know, we have programs and we have laws and we have things to sort of push people to go in the direction that they probably might go by themselves, but it's really helpful if there's a little subsidy. I, or, yeah, what worries me about subsidies, like I'm, I'm all for subsidies for helping a truly emerging industry, um, especially when we're funding research and development, you know, like through our universities and stuff like that. I'm all for government funding for that. Let's find better ways of doing things. Let's fund human ingenuity, and, and humans seeking more knowledge, I'm for that. Um, I think when you get down to where you're subsidizing an industry to produce a product, I think that's a, that's a mistake, whether you're doing it with housing, whether you're doing it with mortgages, whether you're doing it with, with wind energy. It's, it's a mistake. What about with carbon capture? Yeah, well, see, but they're, again, emerging industry, and it, the tax credits are they're not for producing a product. You know, I think that's I think that's a different I think that's a different animal. But, you know, maybe maybe you're seeing maybe you're seeing th hearing that and saying, well, that's a distinction without a difference. But I guess that's the distinction that I'm making at this point. And I certainly don't want those tax credits to go on forever. I think there's a point at which all these industries got to stand on their own two feet, which worries me about when that the production tax credit was supposed to have expired a long time ago. They keep saying they don't need it. And yet Congress keeps magically bringing it back at the end of every year. Um, it's time for that to go. If they were, if they're saying they don't need it, then it needs to go. Yeah, and I'm not going to argue with you on that um, because I can't really. But are we willing to spend a little bit more money for our electricity? Because that's one reason why when electricity is not as expensive as it might be because it is subsidized. I don't know. You know, it's uh, yeah. there's trade-offs there. I I don't have any problem paying increased energy costs and. There are a lot of people who would not feel the same way. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of people who don't have that expendable money in their in their budgets, let's face it, um, which probably yeah. speaks to a larger problem with American society and the number of people who are living paycheck to paycheck, and we could do a whole, uh, a whole year's worth of podcast episodes on those issues. But 
Um, you know, I it's America, and especially right now. I mean, Americans are getting hit hard. I filled up my I filled up my uh, <laughs> my Yukon GMC Yukon this morning, and it was over a hundred bucks at the pump. It was hundred and ten dollars to fill it all because I got right down to E because I was dreading. I kept hoping that you know the prices would break, and uh, yeah, it was hundred and ten bucks. And I'll tell you, I was cringing paying that. So I mean, and and it's it's across the board. I mean prices at the grocery store are up it's it's tough out there right now yeah they are and you know the disparity of course between people who actually have disposable income and those that don't the problem just gets worse every year so so getting back to your the 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 local chapter of the sierra club you you folks actually discussed this and you made a decision not to support it but also not to oppose it so i I don't know what, what would you describe your club's position on it at this point Wait and see. Wait and see. Well, I uh, guess I guess that's a good one. You know, it puts us in, in a minority, I think, compared to a lot of environmental groups. Um, but, you know, we're a pretty practical bunch of people. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. And, again, I think practicality is what's got to – It's I, and it is one thing that frustrates me about so much – of the climate change debate. Well, like anything else in America is how polarized it is. Like, I don't, I don't think wind turbines are a dirty word, right? I don't think solar panels are a dirty word. I think electric cars are cool. Like this, this trend where people are like blocking people from being able to get their electric cars into chargers and stuff like that, I think is, I think is ridiculous. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't know why we feel like we have to have the, these sort of tribal loyalties behind you're either pro coal and pro oil or your pro wind turbine and and pro solar and and the two sides can't overlap anywhere um that that sort of thinking is killing us that's making all of this so much more harder than it needs to be and it's already a difficult issue i agree and it's that's true of course any major political issue that's up today things are very very polarized but what bothers me most about the climate change thing is not as much now as it was five years ago but we still have a whole bunch of people that just don't want to think about it or worry about it or recognize what the potential problems are that are coming down the road. And that's really dangerous. I mean, in the last three years, New York City subway systems have had water in them several times. That stuff's just going to keep happening. And we should at some point say, okay, we got an issue here and we got to deal with it. I, I, feel, and, like, I feel like there's a shift happening. I mean, our Republican governor in a very, very pro-oil and pro-coal state set a goal to be carbon neutral by what was it 2030 and i i don't know i mean whatever you want to think about that goal or how attainable it is or what his motivations are for making it um that's republicans talking in a way that they have not talked about before that seems like a big shift to me i'm pretty impressed by that goal um i have yet to see how it's going to be reached yeah, well, I think they're banking a lot on carbon capture, which you're, I know you're pretty skeptical of, but uh, I guess we're going to see. So uh, as this as this plays out, I mean, what uh, talk for a minute, because a lot of my listeners are going to be in the oil patch. I mean, I'm a conservative guy. Um, it's, I, I know I have a lot of people who are very, you know, they work in the coal industry. They work in the oil industry. And, you know, I, I warn them all the time, like, I'm not in this because I think we ought to be using coal forever just for the sake of using coal any more than I would have been in favor of just continuing to manufacture, you know, horse buggies after the automobile was invented, right? If we find something new and a better way of doing things, then that's what we ought to be using. I'm just not convinced that we have yet. Um, but to speak a little bit as, as, as what you're saying, a pragmatic environmentalist, speak to those people a little bit. How do we find common ground? Well, again, for the uh, coal is North Dakota lignite is not exactly the best source of energy. But if you want to talk to people in the oil patch, um, their jobs are going to be there as far as I can see into the future. It may not be the same as it was last week or last month or last year, um, but we're going to be producing oil. Uh, the world's not going to go cold turkey, and we're not going to shut fracking down in western North Dakota. It's just not going to happen. And I think they should not feel like there's a gun being aimed at their head because there really isn't, at least not when you come right down to what's happening in our state. Nationally, national politics, people say all sorts of things and advocate all sorts of things, and 
you know, that's a little bit different. But North Dakota energy industry is going to keep going. I think coal is going to keep being mined, probably to a lesser amount. I would, I would expect that at least one major coal plant in North Dakota is going to shut down, or another one uh, in the not too distant future, just because the energy industry has moved away from coal, not because of what environmentalists did, but because of economics and natural gas is being used to replace it in many places. And so the days of late night, I, I really feel for the people living in coal country in North Dakota. And I think we as a state need to help rally those people. And if their industry is declined, then we've got to come up with programs to help them get on to the next stage of whatever is coming along. We can't just say, tough guys, you lose, because that's completely not uh, not a fair thing to do to anybody. Yeah, and I, I think, like, like for instance, we saw the big um, the, the rigmarole around Coal Creek Station, and I, I think a lot of the resentment there was you had the company coming out and saying explicitly, at least at the beginning, that they were going to shut that coal plant down and then use its transmission line into Minnesota for wind power, right? So I think the coal people are saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're, we're paying, you know, we can't compete with coal because the taxpayers are paying the wind industry to produce wind energy. Nobody's paying the coal industry to produce coal power. Um, so it just, it just, I, I don't know. I think there was a lot of resentment and I think that's where a lot of it came from where, you know, their argument, and I believe in it, was that Coal Creek Station was still very much economically viable once the politicians take their finger off the scale. And and that's that's really what I would like to do. And, and it's I'm, I realize this is a Sisyphean task, but I'd like the politicians to just keep their finger off the scale and let us figure out what we're doing. And when I say that, like, I very much want to support research and development. I really want to support like, hey, here's a good idea. Let's see if it works. I want to support stuff like that. I want to avoid the I'm 100% wind power and that's what we're going to push it down everybody's throat. I I don't even know if that's making sense at this point, but I don't know. That's that's where I'm at. I, I think you and I are probably pretty much in agreement on that, but tell me this, Rob. Would you support the idea of a carbon tax to incentivize people to move to a low-carbon future? Possibly. Um, it, it would depend on how it's implemented. I, I have a hard time... I mean, especially what's going on right now. I mean, a, car a carbon tax, essentially, that's the stick, right? If, if you're thinking about the carrot, the stick approach, that's the stick. Like, you're going to hurt people economically in order to try to push them in another direction. And, uh, oh boy, I don't know. Because right, because what else does it do? It drives up the price of something that we're already doing to try to force people to make a different decision. And, I mean, first of all, what's the alternative? What are we driving them towards? Electric cars, because we're not ready for it. You know, uh, are we to wind turbines? Because I don't think we're there ready either. So, um, I mean, maybe, um, but I'm very skeptical of, of that sort of stick approach. And I'm also, I'm not sure what, the, I'm not sure the alternatives are ready, frankly. Yeah, and again, you and I probably don't agree on whether the alternatives are ready. Um, I've got a house powered by alternatives. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but does that? But, but, do your, but do your solutions uh, scale? Like, like Dexter Perkins making his house work is very different than every house in Minot working that way. I, I that's right. I don't know enough but, about what you did to say. <laughs> you know, but if the people are building houses all built on with passive solar in mind, everybody could benefit, and it wouldn't add anything to the price of houses. So, but we're get, getting distracted here. My sense is that um, something like a carbon tax. You, you don't want to screw anybody, so you phase it in, right? You have it come in 1% the first year and 2% the second. And, and so people know that five, ten years down the road now, if you haven't decreased your carbon footprint, there's going to be a major cost. Um, I think I would be all in favor of something like that. But to come out and then clobber somebody right away and say you got to pay a premium because you're burning coal in North Dakota, nah, you can't do that. That's just not yeah. going to work. Well, I'd have to see the specifics of your proposal, but um, I, I mean, I, I would start out pretty skeptical. But I am, I am not necessarily against the concept. We'll, we'll put it that way. Well, the reason I was asking is you sound like um, you're telling me, and I agree that people can solve problems, and we just gotta get them thinking correctly and putting their human ingenuity together to solve these issues, rather than having these 
wars and fights back. And I'm with you on that. But sometimes I think you do need the stick. Yeah. And I, we, you know, we have all sorts of zoning ordinances so that people don't build factories in the wrong part of town. A lot of people would say, hey, you can't tell me what I can do with my property. But we accept that kind of thing because we don't want a factory being built next to our school. And sometimes you have to have regulations and things that people otherwise would prefer not to have. The, the, the very, very difficult in this thing is because I, I'm, a, I'm a, as, as you might expect, giving my political predilections, I'm a believer in the marketplace. And so I like the things that people respond to. I think it's best that they're organic. Not that they're, we've, we've created a, a pressure point politically, um, right? Like, so everybody gets hungry. So obviously that's our impetus to produce food and to buy food and all the rest of us. We all get cold. That's why we don't need a law mandating that people make clothing. We need clothing, right? These are very obvious things. The problem is, is that the climate is this externality that is extremely, it's hard to quantify. Um, it, and it's, it's hard for people to wrap their heads around. And then you have all sorts of, I, I would argue, very overzealous people. I don't think Al Gore has done the environmental movement a, a very good service because a lot of his just over the top predictions over the years, they've come, they're not, they've come not true. Right. I mean, Hollywood showing us video, like all oh, these tsunamis are going to come in and cities are going to be destroyed and everything. And, uh, I mean, at one point Al Gore saying we shouldn't have, you know, polar ice caps by now, but we do. And I think that I think that's difficult for I think it's I think it's created this expectation or, or this this feeling in the public that's not unwarranted that a lot of what they're saying is just overwrought and not and not necessarily true and that it's being said to in, in pursuit of a, a political agenda. So, you know, I, I want what people to read. But, but I, I think the, the, again, the confounding part of all of this is that the externality that is the climate is not is not obvious, right? Like if you're running a restaurant, the externality where if you make bad food, people aren't going to come to your restaurant. Like that's a very, that's a very easy to define thing, but the climate is, is not. So how you bring that into a market, like, like a sort of market-based approach to this is difficult. It's something like a carbon tax could produce that, but do I trust the politicians to implement it in, in a way that's not in pursuit of other agendas? I no, not really, but, I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm all over the map on this. I realize I'm I'm struggling with it because I I very oh. much I agree with you that there's a problem. We need to do something about it. I just don't want the solution to be worse than the problem. Well, I I agree with you too. And and I wasn't saying I'm all in favor of carbon tax. What I was thinking was, do we implement uh, government programs, whether they're laws or taxes or whatever, to help influence people towards a behavior that we think is is appropriate, and um, of course, then you have to trust people to identify those appropriate behaviors, and you end up with a whole big slippery slope as you start going forward yeah. on that. But when you talk about the price of uh, climate change, just think if you um, live in Miami Beach and you're told that within 10 years you might have to leave your property because there will be no way to protect it, all of a sudden the price of climate change becomes real to you. Yeah. If, if you believe that that's actually going to happen in 10 years. But again, there's a lengthy track record of environmentalists making Armageddon predictions that just don't come true. And I, I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe the one you're saying is true. I don't know. There's a whole host out there that, that aren't, that didn't come true. And, and that's a problem, I think, for your side. Oh, there's this. It's the other way around, too. There's a whole bunch lengthy track record of people saying that climate change is not going to have any yeah, effect on wildfires fair. in Western United States. Well, we know that's not true. And we know that climate change is responsible for devastating wildfires in California. So people say a lot of stuff that may not necessarily be true. And it, it, the wise man and the wise woman got to get together and figure out what is true and then start thinking about what they're going to do about it. You just can't write off Rob Port as being a wacko or Dexter as being a wacko. you, you got to be thoughtful. Well, at the end of the day, any solution that we come up with, everybody has to live with. And they have to be willing because I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, we saw during the pandemic what happens when people just decide they're not going to follow a policy. I mean, the government can say everybody put on your masks if the public's not buying it. 
They just won't do it. And we don't have enough police to make everybody doing it. And, and frankly, if we're at the point where we got the police out trying to force masks on people, we got a whole other problem going on. So, you know, I mean, that's it's it's got to be a solution that people are willing to buy into. And I don't know. I, I'm reminded of, a, of a, speaking about market, you know, Milt Friedman, actually, he has an anecdote, and I'm going to probably butcher it. But, you know, he was talking about government regulations, and he said, you know, in the marketplace, you could probably save money on oil changes and, and undercut your competitors offering oil changes to the public if you don't pay to dispose of your oil properly. If you just go dump it in the pond out back, you can undercut everybody. But obviously, we need a regulation. That's where the government comes in, right, to say, no, you can't save money that way. You actually have to do dispose of this in a responsible way and not dump it in the pond, right? That was his sort of argument. But that just becomes a very, very tricky area of public policy. I mean, it's very obvious. I think we all agree, don't dump oil in the pond. But when it's something that's not as, as well-defined as oil in the water, it becomes difficult. But Dexter, I, I thank you so much for your time this morning. I think it's a good discussion. And uh, and I was I was very, I, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that your club, at least, is not is not opposed to the pond. Not necessarily supportive, but not opposed I think that's uh, I think that's significant. I, I hope and I hope carbon capture. I know you hope it works too. Let's all hope it works. Yeah. Well, we'll meet in a year and see whether we made any progress on this one. Yeah. Maybe I'll owe you a dollar. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Want more political news like this? Visit inforum.news forward slash port to get three months of unlimited access to our news network for only 99 cents a month. Don't wait. Get this limited time offer at inforum.news forward slash port now.